Good morning and karibu sana. A very warm welcome to all the dignitaries, to members of the press, and especially all the women of Africa that are watching today. My name is Sharon Mashira, and I am Google's PR lead for East Africa, speaking to you today from Nairobi. Happy International Women's Day. So before we get started, I want to condemn a very horrific incident that happened here in Nairobi, where a lady was physically assaulted and molested by motorbike riders who are also known as Boda Bodas after an ensuing accident. And very recently as well, another lady who was found dead in Nigeria after boarding a government-run public transport system. Our hearts go out to both them and their families. Now more than ever, we call on the world to break the bias and end violence against women. Our hearts also go out to women in the Ukraine who are feeling the, the brunt of violence, uncertainty and hardship we stand with them and we pray for peace. So today we have a full lineup of speakers and announcements over the next one hour that I truly hope will keep you glued to your screens. But before we kick off, a few housekeeping reminders, okay? So our hashtag of the day is hashtag look me up. So please feel free to share your thoughts with us. And we also have a social media filter for you to use if you're interested. If you have any comments um, and you want to join the conversation as it goes on, there's a chat box on the live stream on your right. So remember to be mindful and respectful as you type in your comments. So with that said, I'm very excited to invite you to watch the first screening of the Look Me Up anthem that was prepared especially for you today to celebrate the women in Africa that are making a name for themselves. Enjoy. Good morning. I'm Juliet Ehimwa, director for Google in West Africa. Look me up. I loved that video. The women of this continent have such a unique spirit and hustle, and we rightly should celebrate it. These inspirational women are found across all corners of the continent, which is why we've elected to have one Pan-African event today. From Mosa Mkhize in South Africa, who launched Origins Publishers to provide her children and others like them with books in their home language, to Sarah Muindi in Kenya, who founded Hopewell Counseling Firm to provide virtual mental health support during the pandemic, and inspired others to come online too, and Bolanle Austin Peters in Nigeria who created Terra Culture to provide Nigeria's artists with a space to showcase their culture and heritage. The circumstances and context of these entrepreneurs might differ, but they have a common tenacity and spirit. In Africa, women represent 58% of small and medium-sized business entrepreneurs. Despite those high rates of entrepreneurship, women run businesses 
have on average 34% lower profits than those run by their male counterparts. They're less likely to receive funding and investment to say nothing of the digital gender divide in access to internet connectivity and a lack of financial security. Just as closing the gender gap among the labor force leads to economic growth, so can closing the gap among entrepreneurs. As Africa looks to recover from the effects of COVID-19, particularly on the economy, fostering and supporting women entrepreneurs will thus be more important than ever. At Google, we've been long supporters of women entrepreneurship across Africa, and that remains a key focus. Surrounding International Women's Day, we've launched the hashtag LookMeUp campaign to tell the stories of these women who are breaking the bias to increase their visibility across social media and help more women-owned businesses come online and be discoverable through our Google business profiles. We're also complementing our existing skills building programs with a curated set of mini courses available on Primer. And by dedicating the entire March cohort of the Hustle Academy to women owned businesses. You can find out more about this and our other efforts at g.co slash lookmeup. Thank you so much, Juliet. That was really insightful. So it's my pleasure to introduce you now to our keynote speaker, a woman who is no stranger to breaking biases and owning her name, Ms. Bajabulile Swazi Shabalala, who's the Senior Vice President of the African Development Bank Group, having been appointed to the position in November 2021. She reports directly to the bank's president and has a broad range of responsibilities for coordinating the overall work program of the entire group. Ms. Shabalala has nearly 30 years of experience in finance, treasury management, capital markets operations and investments. And she also has a BA in economics from Lawrence University and an MBA from Wake Forest University, both in the USA. Over to you, Ms. Shabalala. Hello, my name is Swazi Shabalala. Look me up. Let me begin by thanking the organizers, Google Africa, for inviting me to speak at this International Women's Day event on a topic of perennial concern facing businesses across the world. At the heart of the debate is the issue of the equal treatment of men and women in society and in the workplace. It's an issue that still brings up intense discussions, usually at a time when this solitary day is set aside to celebrate women's contributions. Gender parity remains a challenging subject despite years of effort to improve the representation of women in the workplace. Women remain underrepresented in the workplace and in economic activity and are not remunerated for their considerable contributions in formal and so-called informal roles. Power dynamics are slow in changing due to biases baked into the way most aspects of our society are organized and the assumptions about what women can or cannot do. However, throughout the course of time, men have been in this position of power, which naturally feeds into the narrative of our everyday lives. A case in point is reflected in the theme of this event, businessmen as the reference, as opposed to the equality reference of business people. Changing this narrative should not be seen as a simple change in bias, but as an essential part of the evolution towards a more equitable society. This requires that women are at the center of development so that their considerable untapped talents are marshaled for a better world. There is evidence that women would make better choices with regards to a range of issues, including the one confronting the global community today around climate change. Women have millennia of experience on how to optimize scarce resources and how to maximize benefit for as many people as possible. We should all be urgently focused on how women can be given the space to showcase these talents. To quote the Canadian writer, Margaret Atwood, will women have solved the many problems in a hundred years by equalizing wealth, for instance, or will women be battling chaos in a collapsed economy 
and a ravaged ecosphere. We have made progress in increasing the role of women in the important business of society, but our work remains. This work must be a sustained commitment and the African Development Bank, like Google, has made a commitment to increasing diversity and supporting women. My hope is that women will be central, not only as the subject of this narrative, but as the protagonist too. Women must rise in, cha in changing the narrative in the midst of several problems that remain in which the responsibility for holding society and our family together rests with us. There are wars raging, human rights voided, famine rules, medical care is hard to get, and women still bear the brunt of the problems faced by our world. Increasing the voice of women and changing the narrative in business and finance has to be key. As a financial person myself, I have many experiences I can share. I recall early in my career when I joined the interest rate arbitrage desk of an investment bank, being the first woman to be appointed in that role. This desk was in a treasury which was largely male. There was a hierarchy of sorts in full display with a few women in the treasury being mainly placed as traders in the money market desk and the bulk of women, and even then still too few, working in the back office. Par for the course, I guess, at the time. I recall being completely ignored in the first week by my colleagues who planned outings post-market close that did not involve me. However, I was determined to not only understand this complex area of financial markets, but to thrive. Once I had mastered the work, I began insinuating myself into the boys' nights. They were reluctant, to say the least, but I was adamant that what was discussed during those evenings would be important for my development and for my career. What I discovered is that in most instances, they don't have grounds for denying your position as a member of the team and that it was important for me to persevere. And it worked. I refused to allow my feelings and emotions to prevail and to unwittingly become a participant in my possible marginalization. Companies must understand that women are ready to lead. We at the African Development Bank have recognized this. We understand, in the words of Kofi Annan, that there is no tool for development more effective than the empowerment of women. Or in the words of the president of the bank, President Adeshina, no bird can fly with one wing. Yesterday, on the eve of International Women's Day, the bank launched its initiative to achieve EDGE certification. EDGE stands for Economic Dividends for Gender Equality. It's a leading global assessment methodology and business certification standard for gender equality. It measures where an organization stands in terms of gender balance, pay equity, policies and practices to ensure equitable career advancement and inclusiveness. The commitment of our organization has already resulted in the number of women in executive management roles increasing from 8% barely two years ago to 38% this year. Where there's a will, there's a way. Our ambitions are to increase the number of women in all levels of the organization to 50% by 2025. And we will do it. Our mandate as a development institution requires that we set our ambitions high. Africa's development depends on it. How can we advocate for the centrality of women in Africa's development when we as an organization don't have the same ambition for ourselves? At the bank, President Adeshina, since assuming office some seven years ago, has worked with a very willing board of directors to change the development agenda for women and to reshape the narrative. The AFDB has created many avenues to support business women in growing their businesses and breaking the bias. To per further push forward the agenda of gender equality and women's empowerment across the continent, the bank recently established the Affirmative Finance Action for Women in Africa 
a flagship initiative that specifically focuses on increasing inclusive finance for women entrepreneurs on the continent. Afawa's primary objective is to bridge the 42 billion annual financing gap for women entrepreneurs in Africa and to unlock their entrepreneurial potential. Afawa is unique as it offers a multi-dimensional approach to remove the constraints women entrepreneurs face in Africa. It addresses their needs for financing, skills enhancement, and a conducive enabling environment to help them grow sustainably. As of January 2022, close to $500 million have been approved for lending to over 2,000 women entrepreneurs and $12 million to enhance 17,000 women business owners and farmers' technical capacity. I can assure you that we are determined. Breaking the bias has to involve all of us in pushing forward the right narratives and ensuring that we stay vigilant in ensuring that progress is being made in the direction of equality. It can take several forms. For women leaders, call out the biases when you see them and pave the way for change to happen. Also, find opportunities to mentor other women as they will be the leaders of tomorrow. For women entrepreneurs, partner with other women so that we can achieve bigger results by coming together. For women in general, make sure that your voice is heard. Companies have done much to advance the agenda of gender, and in my country, South Africa, and in other countries like Rwanda, there has been much progress. I recall that when I joined the executive leagues and heard about the plans that our company had for advancing the cause of women, much of this was focused on training and development. This bothered me because in many instances, these women whose future was being plotted were not included in these discussions. But more disturbing for me was that many of these women were skilled or they would not have had the jobs uh, uh, in these organizations in the first place, and were even overqualified in some instances. I decided to speak up. I said that what women needed more than training and development were opportunities. Opportunities that came easily to men and opportunities that allowed these men to try and fail and learn from their mistakes and be sub subsequently promoted. I respectfully pointed out that women also want the same opportunity to lead, to fail, to learn, not to be judged by a different standard and to eventually succeed. Let's give women the opportunities to flourish and to apply their God-given talent on an equal footing. We will surprise you. Thank you very much for your kind attention. Thank you so much, Ms. Shabalala, for sharing your reflections and advice on breaking the bias. Right, it's now my pleasure to introduce and hand over to my colleague, Bridget. And Bridget is the Google Industry Manager for the Finance Industry in South Africa. And she's also the leader of the Women at Google Africa Employee Relations Group. And she'll also be speaking to the guest on our panel for a discussion on women entrepreneurship, allyship, and breaking the bias. Bridget, over to you. Hello, everyone. My name is Bridget Ngobo, and it is with great pleasure that I say, look me up. I'm a seller at Google, specifically in the Google Ads business. And as Sharon mentioned, I serve as the Women At Lead for Sub-Saharan Africa. Women At is an employee relations group focused on the growth and development of women at Google. I work with a group of dynamic women at country leads to deliver contextually relevant programming across Africa, Ghana, Kenya, Nigeria, and South Africa. And in the spirit of know her name, their names are Carissa, Edda, Kerry, Tololupe, Tutu, Shika, and Yvonne. Thank you, ladies, for all that you do to break the bias at Google. Today, however, I'm joined by an esteemed panel of speakers from all over the continent who are bravely allowing me to try my hand at my other dream job of being a talk show host. And I'm excited to be discussing with this panel, Women Entrepreneurship in Africa. 
the role each of them play and how breaking the bias is critical in allowing women to be visible in this space. Joining me is, is Azizat Oloalua, Women's Affairs Journalist, West Africa, BBC, Charles Morito, Director of Global Affairs and Public Policy for Google Sub-Saharan Africa, Ifenwa Obuchuku, CEO of the Tony Elemelu Foundation, Luca Gallarelli, Group CEO of TWA South Africa, and Yolanda Odida, Founder and CEO of Jura Purple. Welcome all and thank you so much for being here today. The first question is for you, Azizak. As a journalist, um, as he's at, as a journalist, you have a great perspective on the structure and and how men and women's stories are told. From an African context, how do you think gender roles and biases affect the success and visibility of women entrepreneurs on the continent? Thank you, Bridget. You know, first off, gender roles and bias affect women's visibility uh, on the continent in many ways. Let's look at uh, how African women were trained when they were younger. You know, the girl child was trained to be humble, quiet, be seen and not heard, be careful, you know, don't be ambitious. And somehow all of this quality affected their understanding about life and how they see themselves. And this also has been impacting on how African women entrepreneurs run their businesses on the continent. Most of the time, when they see opportunities, they don't even know how to go after them because of self-canceling. They second-guess their qualities. They second-guess if they are you know, good enough to you know, plug into such opportunities. And again, because Africa is a patriarchal society, Many still see the role of African women being in the kitchen, you know, they are supposed to be the ones taking care of the home. So because of that, most of the conditions uh, to get access to capital, get access to mentoring, training, and every opportunity that can grow your businesses are set very high for African women to be able, you know, to, to take advantage of. So that is some of the factors that are affecting uh, the growth of the businesses run by African women on the continent. Uh, thank you, Azizat. What do you think is missing to drive equality in representation? So what is missing is basically the consciousness, you know, to want to do the right thing, to actually drive equal representation, equal visibility for both genders in, you know, in the business world in Africa. Because most of the time you see that um, companies, organizations of the government are not intentional in their strategy, you know, of to make African businesses visible, especially those run by men or women. Some are taking advantage or getting mm -hmm. benefits more in the way these are done. And then the language again is limiting, you know, the language is somehow setting women businesses aside. When you say uh, businessmen or, or, you, you, or you say chairman, you understand. So somehow the language is working against African women as well. Let's use um, my organization, the BBC, for example, because we understand that there is a need to, you know, tell the stories of the underserved community. That is why my role is here, the Women's Affairs Journalist for West Africa, because if you do not um, um, talk about what others are doing, uh, you, there will be a, a development of that silent majority, because that means... Everything the public will be seeing will be through the eyes of those that are lucky enough to have their stories told. And that is why there has to be a consciousness, an intentional strategy, you know, to tell the stories of African women entrepreneurs and all underserved uh, demography. Thank you so much, Azizat. So intentionality and language, some good takeaways for us to remember there. Thank you very much. Now, Luca, as an ads man, you're in the business of storytelling. Do you think that the narrative needs to shift from businessman to business people? And does this need to start with conversations around conventional social and cultural norms? And where do we start? Luca, we can't really hear your sound so well, so we may have to come back to you if anyone, in, I'm going to ask you the next question while we wait for Luca to sort out tech issues, the, the joys of working from home. Uh, if anyone, the Tony Elumeli Foundation focuses on empowering African entrepreneurs. 
And we know that Africa has one of the largest percentages of women entrepreneurs in the world. Why do you think their contribution to the continent is often unseen and not recognized? Thank you, Bridget. I think this is more of an issue of women themselves being unseen and unrecognized. And so logically it follows that their contributions would remain unseen and unrecognized on the African continent. And the reasons for this are quite obvious. Africa has a cultural uh, history or traditional history of not recognizing the autonomy and individuality of women. Take, for example, my own culture. Uh, customary law today still does not recognize the right of women to own property as far as customary law is concerned. A woman cannot inherit property from her father or from her husband. And so property can only be passed on from man to man, never to a woman. You know, so this means that historically women ha are at a disadvantage as, as far as resources is concerned, which is the basis for commercial activity. And even in modern times, you know, we've had an African leader state in a televised speech that a woman's place belongs in the kitchen or in the other room. So the mindset sadly remains dismissive of women as equal partners and equal contributors to our socioeconomic destiny on, as a continent. And yet, studies show that women make up 70% of the workforce on the African continent. They make up majority of the small and medium enterprises who are, as we all know, the primary job creators in Africa. You know, quite frankly, the decades of ignoring this demographic has been to our own detriment. Despite the fact that 70% of Af the African workforce are women, I mean, just go to our villages, go to our rural areas. The farmers are women. The traders in the market, the people buying and selling are women. These women are the entrepreneurs. They work so hard, and yet they earn a meager 30% of the income and own less than 10% of the land and resources. The good news is, it's not all bad news. The good news is that it's no longer business as usual. And days like this, reminds us all of the much needed change. And of course, uh, events like this put together by Google. And most importantly, partnerships like the TEF and Google Partnership. These are vehicles for that change. So in 2021, as you mentioned, Google contributed $3 million to train, mentor, and fund 500 additional women under the Tony Elimelu Foundation Entrepreneurship Program. This is a step in the right direction towards bridging that $42 billion finance gap in women's access to capital compared to their male counterparts. When you look at the books of the average Nigerian bank, in fact, I'm sure most African banks, the entire collateral portfolio is less than 5% women owned. This has got to change. And it's through partnerships like the one we have with Google that we are you know, leading the charge for that change we're doing just that, starting from the bottom up, de-risking women-owned women -owned startups, giving them the seed capital they need to start their entrepreneurial journey and get their foot in the door. We won't stop till we take them from startup to IPO, and collaboration is the key to achieving this. Oh, wow. Thank you so much, Vena. It's true. You know, you go, you go fast when you go alone, but you go far when you go together. Um, so very important there to just cement how important those partnerships are. And thank you for everything that you do. My next question is for you, Charles. Charles, Google recently released a report about the potential of Africa's internet economy. What role do you think women play in driving the economy through entrepreneurship? Thank you, Bridget, and thank you for having us on this panel. It's really exciting to, to be here on this uh, really great day to mark uh, International Women's Day. As you mentioned, we two weeks ago, we launched the 2021 version of the Africa Developer Ecosystem Report. And what's really interesting about this report is that we've seen a growth of 3.8% from 2020 in terms of the number of developers of the African continent to almost 720,000 developers. What's really important about this also is to note the fact that about 38%, almost um, uh, almost over a third of the African developers are working for companies that are not based on the continent. So 
what the, the economic contribution of this is really significant in the sense that it allows Africans to go through that job creation without actually having to work for companies that are here. There's another really important statistic that I wanted or data point that I wanted to mention, which is by 2050, over a third of the world's workforce is going to be based right here in Africa. Mm -hmm. And as Ife Inua mentioned, a lot of those are going to be women creating businesses. We've also seen an Africa Union study that said that African business women, when they make money, they impact society. The uses of the profits that come from African women businesses go back to the community. And uh, not to chastise my fellow male counterparts, we saw that in that study, the use of the capital or the profits that come from male businesses go into more uh, frivolous uh, expenses. I can see as is that nodding profusely, um, but that is just a fact. So what's really mm -hmm. critical as you ask the question, what impact do women have, women entrepreneurs have on economic growth, is that they're helping better educate their children. They are helping better nourish their families. They are helping to create an environment whereby people can thrive. So it's absolutely critical for us to not only bring the, the parity of profitability of women-owned businesses to par with those of men, because if we do that, by the virtue that there are more women-owned businesses in Africa and that women-owned businesses are contributing more to economic empowerment, we shall see a massive transformation in terms of the growth of the economies on the continent. And the, the other piece I wanted to mention is that we should also anchor these women-owned businesses on digital skills and digital transformation. Because what they then do is that they reach new markets, they are able to access capital easier, and more importantly, they're able to access more customers more broadly beyond just the, the, the local commune that they are based. Thank you, Bridget. Thank you, Charles. Women's businesses contribute more to the economic environment. And let's not forget the digital growth component. That's fantastic. Thank you very much, Charles. Um, I'm going to come back to you, Luca. Welcome back. It's nice to have you back. Um, and yeah. the, I will just repeat the question for the benefit of everybody who didn't hear it. Luca, you're an ads man um, and you're in the business of storytelling. Now, do you think that shifting the narrative from businessman to business people needs to start with conversations around conventional so social and cultural norms? Thank you, Bridget. I hope you can hear me now. Um, <laughs> thanks for bringing me back into the conversation. Um, I think Azizat and Charles both both touched on it, um, to be honest. Uh, you know, when Azizat was talking about some of the cultural and societal norms in, in South Africa and, and beyond um, up into the continent, I think that the truth is that they extend beyond just the uh, a societal setting and into a commercial setting too. I think in the main, um, a business is cast in a, in a male image. Um, and I think that businesses tend to recognize, celebrate, and promote um, the attributes that have been traditionally male. Um, so what, is it, what they have required is for women to overtly disp display male attributes in order to succeed in a male-dominated world. I think for us to, to meaningfully shift that, we need to break uh, the convention of what that means. And I think the only way we do that is by telling authentic stories about women who have succeeded, but not in a male world, have succeeded in their own way. And I think Charles touched on it so beautifully when reframing for us the contribution that female entrepreneurs make back to back to community and to society. And you know, I I, I I'm ashamed to admit that that is that that, that was news to me. Um, mm -hmm. you know, obviously I'm I'm aware of my own frivolous spending, but I'm not aware of the the, of the overwhelming contribution that that um, that female entrepreneurs make back to their communities. And I and I think it's these kinds of stories that need to be amplified and and celebrated. Um, because, you know, I think what's important, I mean, for me, and again, um, Aziza touched on it, you know, words matter. Um, and I think we must be very, very deliberate in our use of words and how we choose to frame words. And this is where I, I become a little bit um, ambivalent around 
I suppose, the use of business person or business people, because I think that we potentially run a disservice to the amazing women who have achieved significant success by not calling it out overtly. I think we're having a very specific conversation about female success on the continent, and I think we shouldn't be ashamed or worried to call it out deliberately. Oh, thank you, Luca. Words certainly do matter. Um, my next question is for you, Yolanda, as an SME owner, how can bigger businesses support the success of women-owned SMEs? Okay. So we find that a lot of women-owned SMEs are concentrated in less profitable, less capital-intensive, and low-tech sectors, which then end up paying lower wages and produce less per employee. If this can grow in revenue and uh, profits, millions of sustainable quality jobs can be created. And so by matching up to um, a larger business, this can happen through sourcing. And we see that, for example, the Kenya government has taken the step through a policy called ADPO, where it requires that 30% of the procurement is channeled through a women-owned business. And the government is the largest spender. And we see the private sector mirroring this back and starting to channel their procurement systems through women-owned businesses. So we see the ripple effect that Charles has been talking about um, happening in these areas. So what this does, by inspiring the growth, by giving them um, contracts, we then have changes that can occur within the small business. We are able to improve uh, our org structures, our management practices, and our operations. For example, you see upgrades in tech coming out of these interactions, increases in efficiencies and financial stability. As these organizations that are exposed improve, they then have a ripple effect in the ecosystems in which they exist, where the other small um, women-owned businesses then start to upscale as well. Um, so also out of this interactions, we have a spillover of new knowledge and innovation that then happens from the big corporation into the small. Another way that um, bigger corporations can, um, can impact the small ones is they have a bigger seat at the table, so they're able to influence policy. So that's another area of concern. Mentorship is also another area. Resource sharing, say that there's debt Dead, um, this dead time on a certain resource for a big corporation, they're able to extend that to the, to the women-owned business and build it out to be able to strengthen their capacity. So, yeah, those are some of the ways that the big corp can help. Thank you very much. Thank you very much for that. So it's really important, basically, give the woman contracts and use your seat at the table. Use your seat at the table. Thank you so much, Yolanda, for that response. Aziza, I'm going to turn to you next. You have a special interest in telling stories of women in Africa. Now, what impact has the success of women entrepreneurs had on the continent, and what is the potential going forward? Um, it's had an amazing impact, and it's simply increased economic uh, growth and sustainable development. Although um, there are many, very few of them despite the, the challenges they face every, every day to run their businesses, they have been able to grow these businesses, you know, to, to, to create a name for their brands uh, on a global scale. So basically, we these few women, you know, have let the larger society understand that if more women entrepreneurs get uh, the key support they need, their businesses can actually grow. And like um, Charles and Luca said, you know, and if anyone also mentioned it as well, that most women entrepreneurs are, are not just thinking about making profit, but about, you know, impact, social impact, touching lives, because they are passionate about whatever business they, they want to do. So they inject themselves into it. They, they immerse themselves into it. It's not just about making profit, but about, about contributing to the society, uh, developing the society. So moving forward, basically, we all need to understand that. Uh, really, for African uh, Africa to to get to that point where all of us can say that okay, it's it's developing or it, it has achieved a lot of growth, the the girl child has to be supported. African women entrepreneurs have to be supported because they are many. They are more than the men, the, the men doing business. But so if they don't get the key support they need, um, it means that 
the growth of the, of the continent is going to be stalled. No one is going to benefit from that. So everyone benefits when both gender are promoted, when their businesses are thriving and they get the key support they need. Then the media can come in, you know, to tell the stories of this women. Because it's one thing for you to be doing the right thing. It's one thing for you to be growing in your field. But then when people don't hear about it, how do you, you know, inspire others to want to grow? How do you inspire others to want to, you know, achieve uh, something great? And the African girl child needs that. So for the sake of our young girls, African women entrepreneurs need to get the support they need to drive those businesses. I'm so happy and proud of the women on the continent at the moment because they are doing so well in financial technology, in businesses, in agriculture, in all the fields. They are you know, achieving a great fit and all they need right now is more support, more mentorship, training, funding, someone to hold their hands and take them to the finish line. Thank you so much, Aziza. Thank you so much. Luke, I'm going to come back to you. Um, what, since we have you back, uh, what role do you think allies play in assisting businesswomen in getting their names out there, both online and offline? I, I think it's massive. Um, and I think it's massive beyond just, you know, the PR of it. I think it's massive in terms of helping provide the platform. Um, Yolanda mentioned a short while ago um, the word mentorship and the role of mentorship. Um, and we, we were having an internal session um, at our Exco a couple of days away about a month ago, and we spoke specifically about this. And, and when, it, when it initially came up, I thought, you know, my, my immediate response was, well, doesn't that feel a little bit condescending? Um, but when one understands the role of mentorship in a, in a, in a more... Um, not in the formal mentorship way that we understand it, um, where one would have a mentor and a, and a mentee specifically, but in all of the conversations that happen between the conversations within the workspace. Um, how are senior leaders um, within certain organizations engaging with the female staff? Are they engaging with female staff in the same way they engage with male staff in the conversations in between? And what I mean by that is I mean in the downtime, uh, because so much knowledge transfer happens in those casual conversations in the downtime. Um, and I think that if I think it's incumbent on leaders, both male and female, but because the conversation specifically is, is in this space, it's incumbent on leaders to acknowledge and understand that their role in, 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 in fulfilling the role of mentor extends beyond more formal mentorship conversations and into every interaction that he or she has, has within an organization or beyond, and to be cognizant of the impact that they can have on, on an individual's growth. Um, as I say, it's, it's in some of those passive knowledge transfer opportunities that, that, so, that so, much is, so much is learned and so, so much impact um, can be felt. Thank you so much, Luca. So it's in the downtime. There's a secret source in the conversations we have in the downtime. And Aziza, just like you, I'm super proud of, of the business by the women business owners in on this continent and the work that they're doing. And Yolanda, you're one of them. Um, and I love the beautiful leather goods that you sell on Pure Purple, which is predominantly an e-commerce business. Now tell us, how do you see digital and social platforms? enabling women entrepreneurs to get their names out there? Okay. So I think it's um, down to strategy because what the digital and social platforms do right now is they literally make the world a global village. So we have access to the whole world. So the only difference between, say, a bigger name brand, um, say Rihanna's brand, to say my brand is the dollars. How much money am I able to give Google to boost my ads? That's all it's down to, otherwise access is the same. So um, we really like this about digital and the social platforms. We also find it to be an opportunity to learn from more advanced markets. We're able to see them and see what it is that they're doing. Uh, we find that uh, we're able to target a niche market and it, when it becomes niche, it's not just niche, me in Nairobi, in my corner in the world, it can be niche global. And that's also a really good thing. We find that it's also informing how we create. Say, if I'm targeting a particular market, say Dubai, there are certain sensitivities towards that market that I would then have to factor in. And I'd be like, okay, I have this product and I want it to go there, so probably it needs to have this colorway or that kind of length and things like that. And social media does this. 
Um, there's also the ability to reprimand. I don't want to use the word viral because it's always attached to something bad. However, <laughs> the ability to send something, say even on WhatsApp and say, hey, there's this, I've liked it or I've seen it, or even how social media works. It can really create a churn. And um, if you do it right, you don't have to spend so much money doing it. Sorry, Google. But then, yeah, <laughs> it, could, it could work as well. So we like those things about um, how digital and social media platforms work. We feel like it's down to strategy. We're so excited that we can take on the world because of it. So, yeah. Thank you, Yolanda. We are so proud to be part of being able to bring your products to the world. Um, that really is an incredible, an incredible thing to be um, a part of. Charles, I'm going to go to you now. Um, you're a small business owner yourself. Um, so what do you think needs to change in the policy environments to actually help small businesses accelerate? Thanks, Bridget, for that question. Policy is something that we cannot get away from. Um, governments and, and the structure of governments uh, across the world are an integral part of how we work and how we build businesses. So there's a couple of key things that I want to mention. The first one is looking at policy harmonization. Uh, what I'm talking about around that is how are the policies across different countries, especially when you're thinking about Africa, going to be from one country to the next. So for instance, if Yolanda is trying to um, sell goods and services to Uganda from um, Kenya or to Nigeria from Kenya, how does that look like in terms of taxation, um, import and export duties, um, withholding taxes, um, other elements such as cross-border data flows? Because if your lander is going to uh, be receiving personal information from a customer in Nigeria, if there's data localization uh, laws that prohibit that information from flowing from one country to the next, she cannot actually be able to get that information, that customer's information uh, while she's based in Kenya. So policy harmonization and looking at the, the African continent as one broader trading block is absolutely critical and we need to really think about that. The second piece is around e-governance. How are we leveraging governments to allow us to really take an advantage of um, getting the right permits, et cetera, in a simplified way and also in a straightforward way so that a, a, a small business owned by a woman in Kenya can be able to figure out how to access the Nigerian market um, in the most simplified way possible. Um, so that's another uh, piece. The other one is something that uh, both Azizat and Ifeinwa mentioned around access to capital. On this particular one, I want to really specifically talk about collateral. So if you have a makeup artist who's looking to scale her business, for instance, um, that business does not have the kind of capital or collateral that a traditional bank will ask when it comes to business. So we need to start looking at how do we look at other forms of collateral, other forms of securing capital for small and medium-sized businesses who are starting up can be able to look at the policies can be put in place, which create a more simplified way of looking at that. And then the last but not least is access to new markets. Um, and on that is really looking at what are some of the barriers that are prohibiting um, small and medium-sized businesses from scaling, whether it's um, standard bureau certification that allow a product to move from one country to another, how can we be able to simplify that? Um, in essence, more holistically, is saying how do we really make Africa a unilateral trading block, which the, the African Continental Free Trade Agreement allows for that. The, the, the devil will be in the details of how we start implementing that across the board. So I look at um, the African continent as a fantastic trading block. In fact, Af AFICTA is the largest single trading block uh, since the WTO was established. So we have an opportunity to really leverage this market, create centers of excellence across the continent so that the entire continent can rise up together. Thank you so much, Charles, for that input. I mean, I know Yolanda had also mentioned how important it is for 
for bigger businesses to use their seat at the table to implement some of those policy changes and to talk about those policy changes. So thank you for putting Yolanda's advice to you straight away and inputting on that answer. Thank you. If anyone, the next question is for you. The Tony Elumeli Foundation recently received the $3 million grant in funding from Google.org to offer to African women entrepreneurs, and you mentioned this in your answer a little bit earlier, to support specifically the growth of their businesses um, and their own growth. You must have a wealth of inspirational stories from these women and from these businesses. Please, can you share with us just one or two that really stand out for you? Thank you, Bridget. And I must tell you that it is really hard to pick one or two because all these women have simply amazing stories. Um, but I can't go through all 500. So as you know, uh, TF Google Partnership uh, trained and funded 500 women in Africa. Uh, the funding was a non-returnable seed capital of $5,000. This was in 2021. Um, and, you know, these women are Amazons who are transforming the African continent, one community at a time. So we have Shannon, who is from South Africa, and she has a company she recently incorporated called Magic Room. You know, Shannon turned a problem into a business, and this is something I continuously preach to African entrepreneurs. Yes, we know that Africa is fraught with problems, a lot of the problems that the West doesn't face, but these problems are actually business opportunities in disguise. She turned a sanitation problem into a business opportunity, which today is providing training and employment opportunities to the youth in her community. The funding that she received from the Google TF partnership has helped her to buy the much needed equipment for her cleaning and gardening business, as well as to brand and market her company. And now she's a provider of employment. Poverty in Africa uh, is disproportionately uh, 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 you know, impacting women everywhere we go. You know, and it's actually been called the phenomenon of feminization of poverty. Uh, and so another example is um, uh, Lebogang Magoni, who struggled with three jobs and still could not make ends meet, even with three jobs. She applied to the Tony Elwele Foundation Entrepreneurship Program and was selected under the Google Partnership. Her business, Rory Green Property Limited, is an agro-processing startup for premium dried fruits using innovative technology to process the fruits as a meal or a snack. Leborgen said, and I want to quote what she said, she said, I would not have been able to start my own business without the program. Watching my child grow without the basic necessities has been so challenging and depressing. But with this opportunity, I feel like I have been given a second chance. Lebogen now sees that her dreams have become a reality and hopes that other single mothers who dream of a better life will achieve it through programs like the Tony and Willow Foundation Entrepreneurship Program and private sector leaders like Google, who are investing in women entrepreneurs across the continent. You know, on her part, she's no longer a job seeker. She's now a job creator with direct and indirect employees for her ivory business, including the local farmers she buys from, some of whom are women. There are millions of liberal gangs across Africa, and our call to action to our friends and our partners is that we must engage and impact each and every one of them, ensuring that there's no woman left behind. Thank you, Fenya. That it was truly inspirational. Um, having been raised by a single mom myself, that that Lebo Gang story really hits home for me. Um, and when you reflect on some of these stories, what are some of the biggest game changes and mindset shifts that have unlocked growth for these women? I think one of the greatest game changes must be the, the fact that we are all now tapping into the resilience and determination of African women. And this is coming from a very deep place. You know, we, 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 we know, have you ever seen a lioness protecting her cubs? That's African women for you. Because financial freedom is the greatest protection for her child. And I think one of the panelists has, has referred to this, that when a woman is financially free, she spends it on her home, on her community. And this is why, you know, to quote the uh, president, addition of the Africa Development Bank, he said that 95% of all women microfinance debtors pay back their loans, and the 5% who don't are stopped on their way to the bank by their husbands. But African women entrepreneurs are resilient. 
they are hardworking, they are trustworthy, they are reliable, and they never give up. My money is on them to turn the continent around for good. Rwanda is an excellent example of this. We see firsthand the difference equality and gender balance has made in that country. In 2003, the Rwandan government set up a deliberate and intentional policy of a 30% quota for female participation in government. 10 years later, by the, by the 2013 elections, women made up 64% of parliament in Rwanda. And so Rwanda's unprecedented growth and improved standard of living for all its citizens is the, is the dividend of this singular decision. Anyone who is genuinely interested in sustainable growth and economic prosperity will prioritize gender balance and equality. So just to wrap up, I know that we don't have much time, but the truth is we still have a lot of work to do from safeguarding the education of the girl child to ensuring financial inclusivity for women in Africa. We need to instill in every African female that can do spirit, that self-reliance and grit that says that you are not defined by your family, you're not defined by your community or your government, that you can be anything you want to be. We need to break down those traditional and historical barriers and biases to ensure that she is truly free within and without. And only through this will we unleash the power of woman on the entire African continent in order to build our own real life Wakanda. Sorry, I couldn't resist that. <laughs> Thank you very much, Ifena. After that, I don't know how all of our money should be on, on, on women <laughs> and women entrepreneurs now. Thank you so very much for that inspirational answer and for just taking the time to walk us through some of those stories. Really, really appreciate it. And Yolanda, our final question today is for you. As our SME business owner on the panel, we thought it important to end with you. What do you um, what would you like to see change in the ecosystem that supports you and businesses like yours to make you more successful and other businesses like yours more successful as well? Oh, you're on mute, Yolanda. I said I have an entire laundry list, but um, <laughs> let's just try and condense that. So I think I'm going to use your faces to kind of categorize them and we'll go with one of the biggest pain points we have is access to markets. So this is Charles Morito of Google and Luca Brandy, um, marketing. So yeah, so <laughs> access to markets is a really big uh, pain point. And what we like about IT and digital and all of these things is, as I had said before, it opens us up to the world. And even though we are businesses that are in local places, we are able to create for the world from the get-go. So I really want to see more of that, like the more access to markets. And then I'll look at Ife Yinwa and go through business development support. So that would be Tony Elemeli. So more training, more mentorship to get more people equipped so we have the SMEs doing what it is that they're supposed to do. More women businesses, as you had from Azizat, we are more efficient with how we are handling the money in terms of community impact. Uh, we think about who's at home, who's in the community, and we want to bring everybody along. So we want to see more and more of that. I go back to a point Charles had said about policy. Policy holds everything together. And some of this is government, but some of it is not. So there's that as well. And when we say policy, it's not only the implementation of, of the setting of the, the policy itself. There's also the implementation part that we are speaking about. And then we want to see stronger policy coordination. So you find that even though we have all of these policies, there's no coordination between the stakeholders. So there's repetitiveness and things like this, which impacts efficiency, which then, of course, dictates the outcomes that we'll see in the end. Financing. Access to finance continues to be a problem and it's systemic, especially if you look at it on the women's side. 
And though there are no laws that says we cannot have property, it's just the way the cultures are set up. Mm -hmm. I like something that Luca had said before, that we need more stories of women mm -hmm. who have made it. And we need to be very careful also with the narrative of how we deliver that story. Because we've seen that sometimes stories get out, but they're skewed. They'll show you women succeeding, but then they want to show it in like softer businesses, but not in fields where a man would be able to go out and do it. And so I feel like we need to see more of this so that we start to see the representation um, and more women are able to get out and formulate these businesses and, and go out there. Another thing is I don't want it to seem like we're just leaning heavy on the woman. It's also... I feel like there's something that's very empowering about a woman who is set free. The way she even interacts with the male population, it changes. And we want to see more of this, where a man is not feeling like, ah, why do I have to listen to her as my boss because she's female? It just changes how that dynamic works. And I feel like it, it's, it's beneficial for the entire ecosystem. So, yeah, we also want to see more of the synergies between big businesses and small businesses. We see Google leading with that. Um, I watch closely and see how you're sourcing. And there's, it, it seems like there's an intentionality to shop local, which is highly, highly appreciated. Um, and so we want to see this in, in all the markets replicated. Because if you're shopping local, of course, you have a direct impact in the ecosystem in which, which you're existing in. Um, I think I've covered quite a bit now. So yeah, efficient legal and judicial system, we want to see that as well. I know everybody wants better tax regime. And when we say favorable, we mean less, but yeah, favorable tax regime. So yeah, so there's a whole, there's a whole stack of things, but yeah, those would Thanks. be some of the main Thank you very, very much, Yolanda. And thank you to the panelists for joining us today and for sharing your wisdom. It has been incredible to have you. Girl, child, you can do anything. Women who are breaking biases, keep breaking biases. Male allies and all allies, please keep being allies. Thank you for all that you do. It has been incredible to have you. Happy International Women's Day to one and all. I'm Folake Edun. I am Sinitlant Angela. I'm a Chenyo Idacheba Obaro. I'm Mokadima Bila. My name is Maya Leko. Look me up. 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 Thank you to all our panelists for sharing their insights and to our lovely moderator, Bridget. My name is Mojola Lua Aderemi Makinde, and I'm the head of brand and reputation for Google in Sub Saharan Africa. Look me up. You've heard today that women are an integral part of Africa's economy and that the continent has one of the highest percentages of women-owned businesses in the world. But the job is not done. As Juliet shared, women-owned businesses disproportionately struggle to receive funding and can be less profitable and have less access to digital tools needed to drive their businesses forward. Today, I'm delighted to announce that Google, through its philanthropic arm, Google.org, is committing $1 million in charitable grants to help women entrepreneurs in Africa be more successful. These funds will support organizations providing skills, improved access to capital, and networking opportunities for women small businesses in underserved communities. This is to help create pathways to economic advancement for themselves and their communities. We also believe that in addition to skills development, funding and funding, visibility is key in helping women-owned businesses in Africa thrive. Not only for driving their customers, 
We also believe that in addition to skills development and funding, visibility is key in helping women-owned businesses in Africa thrive. Not only for driving customers to their businesses, but also for potential collaboration and investments. We recently included the women-owned attributes on our Google business profiles, allowing people to discover and search for these businesses on Google search and maps. And we are telling the stories of these women entrepreneurs as part of our Look Me Up campaign. Thank you. Thank you, Jola, for that exciting announcement. Everyone loves an announcement about money, hey? <laughs> so for more information, people can head over to g.co forward slash look me up. It's been an absolute privilege to spend the last one hour with you all. And I'm so inspired about the future of women in Africa. I'm Sharon Mashira, and you can look me up. And with that, to wrap us up, over to you, Agnes. I agree, Sharon. What an inspirational session. There's an unattributed quote that says, when sleeping women wake, mountains move. And with the right support, the women entrepreneurs of Africa have the potential to move nations. My name is Agnes Gadaya. I'm a director here at Google with responsibility for East Africa. Look me up. You've heard today that entrepreneurship is key to economic growth and job creation but it can also be an important tool in reducing gender inequality. At Google, we understand this, which is why we've always aimed to be as helpful to female entrepreneurs across Africa as possible, and will continue to do so. You've also heard this morning about some of the latest of our initiatives in this front, but it's not the last. Every piece of support we provide to women-led businesses builds on the last, and we continue building to play our part in helping women strive for equal access to entrepreneurial opportunities with the right skills. Thank you to our speakers, Ms. Shabalala, Ifeinua, Luca, Azezat, and Yolanda. Thank you to my colleagues, Juliet, Charles, Sharon, and Jola, and to you for watching. You can find more information about today's announcement and links to additional events, workshops, and training opportunities at g.co slash lookmeup. Happy International Women's Day. Thank you.